The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Festool. Faster, easier, smarter. And by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. No, it's it's a pleasure to be in your shop. This is awesome, and I think people are gonna are, are gonna really enjoy seeing an inside peek to a uh, a major editor's actual home shop. It's gonna be pretty cool. Um, but before we get into all that, I just kind of wanted you to give us. I mean, I know some of this stuff because I read your book. And if anyone hasn't read it, you should. Workbenches. What's the subtitle? The, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. It's blue, bluish gray. The blue one. <laughs> Buy the blue one. It's a very good book. But um, as far as your history and how you got where you are now, if you could just give us the you know, 30 to 40 second rundown of your life uh, in 30, 40 seconds. Um, and how you got to the point that you are now working for Pop Woodworking. Yeah. Um, I started off uh, building uh, houses on our family farm with my dad and we didn't have any electricity on the shop, wow. uh, on the site, and so it was all hand saws and brace and bit and uh, <laughs> really miserable and I hated it. Yeah. I wanted Santa Claus to bring me a circ saw <laughs> okay. and a five mile long extension cord, right. uh, but he didn't. And so we built the first house without power and then... Uh, we got power after that and built the second one, and that really got me into mm -hmm. uh, working with wood. And uh, really, right after college, even though I had become a newspaper reporter and I was, you know, chasing fires and chasing ambulances and uh, chasing whatever, mm -hmm. uh, I was learning to build furniture at night and uh, building out on the back porch with a circ saw, a jigsaw, all my grandfather's old stuff and building furniture to fill our house, just like everybody else. And yeah. after a few years of being a newspaper reporter, I realized, you know, I really would just love to do this woodworking stuff mm -hmm. and find a way to use both my skills. And I only have two. <laughs> I have, both of them. I'm a man, so I have one feeling and two skills. Okay. So don't, don't hurt my feeling. <laughs> right. And uh, my two skills, which were woodworking and writing. And saw an ad uh, in the Sunday paper uh, for popular woodworking, and that was 12 mm. years ago, and they have wow. not been able to get rid of me since. That's a good thing, I think. I think everybody's benefited from uh, from the just the contributions you've made have been great. Um, I guess, in terms of uh, what you now do, your daily activities at work, you're you're consuming this stuff constantly. Not just consuming, you're producing it constantly, and you're you're drowning in woodworking content, so to speak. And here we are in your home shop, you know. Um, how how does it you know how does that work for you? Are you able to uh, unplug and separate that which you do at work, come home and still enjoy your time here and just have fun like the rest of us do? And we get well, I say we, but I'm no longer in that workforce anymore. You are one of um, us. <laughs> I'm one of the one of these guys. But um, you know, when you come home, six o'clock, are you coming in the shop or you know is it? It's just something you just don't want to see anymore at that point. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's funny because, you know, my affection for the craft has gone has been different from the way I've seen a lot of pros. I'm not mm -hmm. a pro. I mean, I do build a few commission pieces every year, but it's not what I do. It's a special circumstance, really. Yeah, yeah, it's friend of a friend. Somebody wants something special and I want to build it anyway. Sure. I, I do that. But I'm I really come at it from the amateur point of view. And mm -hmm. and the funny thing was is that when I started, I hated it. It was like my dad was, you know, it was like I had to go I couldn't play with my friends. I couldn't, you know, <laughs> couldn't go out uh, causing trouble and, yeah. and this, that, or the other. I had to be down at the farm mm -hmm. uh, sawing, you know, two by twelves for, for joists and hated it, had wanted nothing to do with it, said I would never have anything to do with wood and, uh, and but there's something in the blood and mm -hmm. it's, it gets just gotten worse every year for me. You can ask my wife and it's, it's the trajectory towards total obsession <laughs> has, has been worse it, or better. Uh, yeah. You're, well, it depends on me or her. <laughs> right. um, but when I, I mean, my typical day is I get up, you know, at five 15, I'm in the office by seven. I'm, uh, you know, working there till four, mm -hmm. come home, make the kids, uh, and my wife dinner to help with some homework, help with the baths. And then, Either I am designing on the computer for the next issue, you know, okay. some, you know, some sort of piece in CAD, or trying to catch up on email, or I'm down here building. And, and it is a still a working shop, and it's always a little bit of a mess. And sure. uh, I just, I relish every minute I have down here. And right. it's just only, I only see it getting worse. <laughs> um, 
Sorry, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty humble beginnings as far as the tools you started with. And I think a lot of people may, I don't know if it's, well, I guess because a lot of what you focus on is hand tools. So there's an assumption that you're just a hand tool guy. You, you know, you don't own a table saw. You actually cut everything with a hand saw. Um, but I see a pretty good complement of your standard uh, power tools that we would expect in a, in a modern woodworking shop. Um, how, you know, how, how is the situation, how would you describe it now? You're, you really are a power tool person as well, sort of a, um, a hybrid of power tool, hand tool usage, right? Yeah. And, I mean, how has that changed things for you uh, coming from the humble beginnings to what is available to us now? Yeah. Um, well, I started off in hand tools, and then I got a few power tools, thank God, uh, <laughs> from my grandfather, and was able to build some things. And power tools really accelerate your, your learning curve. They allow you to do things you probably shouldn't be able to do or yeah. allow, be allowed to do. Um, but, you know, I really, for me, in the end, I don't understand anybody who is in one camp or the other. Right. I don't understand the all power tool people any more than I understand the all hand tool people because, for me, there is this richness that you can get from combining the two perspectives. You get the speed and the labor-saving devices when you're trying to surface stock, but you're getting the fine details from, uh, from the hand tools that the, the power tools just aren't capable of. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for me, you know, I, I'm trying to turn areas of that I dislike doing, like sanding for six hours on a project, mm -hmm. into something I really enjoy doing, which is like planing for you know a couple hours. Sure. Um, so I'm just really trying to maximize pleasure. I'm just a total woodworking hedonist. Um, <laughs> and also, you get to buy more tools. I mean, it's like you know, you get to just not buy the sander. You get to also buy the smoothing plane and you right, get to right. buy this, that, or the other. It's it's so it's it's all about the crack. <laughs> that it is. Um, do you do you think people are at a disadvantage these days? I think most people, whereas you began with hand tools and worked your way up and were like, you know, you, you created the need for the power tool. Hmm. A lot of times people today, and I'm certainly guilty of it, I actually went from the opposite direction. I had the money to be able to afford that circular saw, so I bought it right away. I wasn't using hand tools. Do you think that puts modern woodworkers or people who are new to the craft at a little bit of a disadvantage? Because they sort of have to work... Uh, backwards in almost a nostalgic kind of fashion to find out what all this stuff does because this is where we start. It can be nostalgia, but it's also what I hear from people is that you know people a lot of people start out in power tools and a lot of that is influenced by what they see on television. You know, Norm right. Abram who's brought so much to the craft, but mm -hmm. but his show for the most part at the beginning of his career really was very power oriented and mm -hmm. yeah. that's the way a lot of people came into it and they assumed that that is what they needed to do. But you get to a point where you hit the wall. And it's like, I can't take my skills any further until I get some, a different set of tools or sure. a different set of mindsets. Um, I think people are at a psychological disadvantage because I think in woodworking, um, you know, new perspective, new designs, new tools, it's mostly a mental barrier than it is a real dexterity. Sure. Battle. I'm, I'm quite clumsy. <laughs> and so it's not, it's not like I'm like super, Mr. Superfingers. It's... Uh, it, hand tools, the proper hand tool, properly tuned up, works by itself, and you just have to kind of get out of its way. Right. So I think most people just have to say, you know what, I need to, I'm need. i interested in it, get into it, give themselves a little bit of education, have someone show them how to sharpen, and once they can sharpen it, it's, it's, all, it's all downhill. Sure. I would say in the past year, um, you've gone from sort of mild-mannered, um, humble woodworking editor to the Schwarz. <laughs> that's quite a transition and uh, why blogging you seem to be very proactive in the world of blogging and I think you know you sort of set the standard for what a high quality uh, woodworking blog should look like and what it should do um, where's the fuel behind that because sometimes you see in cer certain old media they're a little resistant to some of these new things um, you guys seem to embrace it so is this just a personal thing because of your addiction that is another way to get it out there um, or is there, is there something else there? What's... Well, there's a couple things. Is that one, one thing is when you have new young woodworkers coming into the craft, I want to provide some sort of outlet for them on the Internet where they can find a source of information that, that says, you know what, handwork is okay. Mm -hmm. And handwork is a perfectly acceptable part of uh, a, you know, any sort of shop. And so by providing that outlet, I'm hopefully getting some people into it who will not just automatically go the power tool route, but will yeah. try to blend both. But really, the, the blogs, as, as much as they are a good 
um, vehicle for the magazine is that you know I'm a professional writer and I grew you know I came up in newspapers where you I would produce two sometimes three stories a day sure. and so it's really it was really hard for me to go into the magazine world to kind of pinch that off <laughs> right. and you know to buy you know atrophy that because it, yeah. it, it's like I, I just I just was trained to write like a demon and sure. I can't not do it and so the magazine there's only like two pounds of crap and like a hundred pounds of crap that has to go in there when I have the blog it's like an outlet for everything I can just I can and I can be much more freeform about it um, I can I, I don't have to be as rigid as when I'm in, or writing for the magazine and uh, and also, you know, the, the, the readers egg you on. I'm sure you know that. <laughs> yeah. Is that, you know, once they get jazzed about it, you feed back on it, and it's just mm -hmm. like it's an endless cycle of, uh, you know, how much, how much you know, more can you do. Yeah, was that an unexpected side effect of all that? I mean, you make the blog, you put the article there, and next thing you know, now you're almost answering to people in some sense by the things you say, the opinions you express, yeah. and the frequency with which you write. You know, yeah. it becomes an issue. You're right, it does, and I know you see that too. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, uh, it comes with the territory. Though. It does, but it's a good thing because it means they care. I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't know if anybody would read a woodworking blog when we right. first put it up three years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody even really in our company knew what a blog was. <laughs> and uh, now we have, I think we have like 300 of them at our company, yeah. and it's, it's, it's really changed. And, and then, but of course, the thing that really has me worried is that blogging is for old people. Um, it's really you know, sort of the social networking side of things. Yeah. And now I've got to start learning Facebook and MySpace <laughs> and Twitter and all these other things to, uh, you know, to really uh, keep up with it. It's, it is. It's tough to keep up with. And we're in the thick of it. And we still, we're like, oh, we're months behind some of these things. We're like, this is, everybody knows about this? Why don't we know about yeah. this? Where did this come we got to do this. Yeah. We're, we're always playing catch up. I think it's just the, the nature of the beast, unfortunately. Um, you know, I would love to get a little quick tour of the shop, starting with this monster right here, this gorgeous bench, tell us a little bit about it, and um, I'm sure people will already recognize it. Yeah, this is the Holtzoffel uh, workbench, which is from an 1875 drawing uh, in an old, you know, old English book. And it combines a lot of old school cool features like this, this undercarriage where the, the front leg is flush to the front edge of the bench top, which allows you to really clamp anything you need here or here. Uh, anywhere you need to go. Uh, the top is fairly thick, it's more than three inches, so I don't have to have any apron under there so I can clamp things. Right. Um, but mostly what I really love about this thing is like the big twin screw, is having 24 <laughs> inches. Uh, hey, I can say that. Uh, <laughs> having 24 inches between uh, allows me to put a whole case side in there and just dovetail away. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to come up with some crazy rigging um, to, to do that. And this thing just has a grip like a monster. Um, I, I mean, believe it. I could probably punish my children by putting their hands in there. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's the major number one feature of, of this bench that, that's just really awesome. And this is made from some uh, curly ash that was cut here locally. I always try to use local woods and then some uh, bird's eye that I had sticking around. So it's, uh, it's, it's a little flashy. It's mm -hmm. not southern yellow pine, but it's for, my, <laughs> it's for my house. I can do that. You can indulge yourself. I can indulge bit. myself. So is this your current favorite design at this point, or have, um, you, have you moved on to another love? <laughs> I try to stay true as long as I can, Mark. Uh, actually, I mean, I've really fallen for the twin screw, and what I probably want is more, like, uh, would end up, if I had to do it all over again, would be a bench that's kind of like what's in the Domini shop at Winterthur, which is a really long bench that looks like the Rubo, okay. you know, big thick legs like a tree, French tree, and then a big twin screw on it for dovetailing. And okay. uh, that's probably the bench I would end up with in the end. But I, this thing works so well, and I don't have a 12 foot space, as you can see, <laughs> right. in my Cinderbuck paradise. <laughs> um, the other thing is that it's also cool about this wall that I really like is that that's sort of my shrine to, um, to wow. Lee Nielsen and, and all the other people that I give all my money to. I just got uh, lightheaded. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I always see it a little bit too and I go, ah. Yeah, that's and, very uh, cool. Yeah, like this is um, one of Wayne Anderson planes that he made for me. This is like sort of a, a 15th, 16th century um, plane and yeah. uh, really cool. Everybody thinks it's a canthus leaf is really weak, but if you feel it, it's really kind of, it's really stout. No, you lean that's, on that. uh, that's sturdy. Yeah, but that's a cool little plane and um, yeah, that's what I spend my money on. Gorgeous, and, yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> it is. 
But uh, no, I keep all the planes up here, and then I can just you know reach here. I like having everything at hands reach, so mm -hmm. I never have to take half a step. Because pretty much all, once everything gets through the assembly phase, which is in the machines stand behind me, everything takes place right here. Okay. So I can, you know, reach in here for um, all, a lot of the little tools that are less uh, frequently used, and then up on the wall uh, for the tools that I use just every every day, all the time. Sure. Um, yeah. And then I keep a bandsaw. Um, I keep the bandsaw by the bench because um, the. Uh, I mean, it's probably my favorite power tool. And if I only had to have one machine it would uh -huh. probably be uh, a band song cool and uh, that's one of my one of my favorites that I rehab that's actually an old piece of machinery old from Rockwell, the 70s huh? nice. yeah actually we found it in a, a an old uh, <laughs> old hardware store it had been sitting in there unused new okay. in the box uh, and it had it was still a little rusty but it hasn't it's only got like you know like a year's worth of work on it and it's a 1970 wow. so the rehab cool. is great it looks looks fantastic well, thanks yeah, thanks that's good and then like a uh, unisaw with a sliding table. Uh, cool. Sliding table is one of my, uh, uh, you know, things that I just can't work without once you use one. Um, <laughs> it's, it's uh, you don't know how people work with miter gauges and I don't understand how I did for so long, uh, just dealing mm -hmm. with big uh, repetitive cross cuts. Sure. And um, back there is the joiner, and, uh, which is an old Powermatic. Uh, Eight American inch, looks like. Eight inch Powermatic and also, I hope you, well, I don't know if you can see it, but the, the winemaking class uh, results are down there too. So, <laughs> um, and the wood rack is kind of fun. My first wood rack uh, collapsed one night when we were uh, watching television. It sounded like the world was, oh, no. was dying. And then back there are the other tools on that wall behind the shelving unit that I'm installing this week. Uh, the planer, which I roll out when I need it. Uh, the miter saw for mm -hmm. uh, knocking down stuff and, and doing some mitering, though most mitering I do by hand. Sure. Um, but really, and a mortiser, I, that's the other tool that I'm just like really totally in love with when you're building arts and crafts furniture, like, ah, especially. Indispensable. Uh, yeah, it's kind of <laughs> like, you could hand mortise it, but you're, you're just, you're asking for it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, well, Rafter clamp storage. Yeah, I didn't finish the top for, for that. So, yeah, these are, these are fairly okay, I think it's the nicest thing to say about them. They look really good, <laughs> <laughs> more than they clamp, but. Uh, but that's really about it. You know, some festival stuff, I sprung for the domino and uh, love that. And also the, the little CT-15, which is just a great little vacuum. Yeah. Um, and that's my grandfather's bench, actually. Oh, wow. I brought back over the mountains uh, from that's his awesome. shop in Connecticut. And cool. It's cool to have. Yeah. It's not so good to use, uh, which <laughs> is what's kind of set me down my path. But, yeah. uh, uh, but I still like to you know, keep it around. That's great. Yeah. And it's good to see um, the use of uh, a tight space, a relatively tight space. And um, you got to get a good workflow, you got to get a good setup and arrangement from one tool to the next. And it's, and it's great to see the blend of hand tools and power tools. I think that that's where most people should aim, you know, to get the most out of their time in the shop. I like to think so. I mean, I'm, I'm really happy here and I can't imagine, I haven't changed this setup for three or four years now. so I. I, uh, I, I'm pretty well settled. That's a yeah. long time in shop time. Everybody rearranging all the time. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like makeover that's time. just part of the hobby, I think. And the one other thing I'll add about small shops that I really like is that I've also worked in a lot of big shops mm -hmm. uh, with other people, and there's there's a lot of walking around in big shops <laughs> <laughs> where you're like ten you feet forgot, between each tool. <laughs> yeah, or you forgot your square over up at the at the bench, and so sure. it's up there and back, you know, three or four times a day. Whereas here, you know, I've really liked the tightness where I'm just going from. You know, I, yeah. all the stock comes in the door, it gets processed there, and then it just goes across the table saw, and then it's back here at the bench for assembly, and then yeah. final assembly goes right at, back at the door. Um, and I'm never more than five or six steps away from uh, where I need to be, and that's, that, I, I like to keep it tight. I would think there, there's a little misconception about how much space you really need to survive, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think, I don't know, I know in our space, sometimes having too much open space without a wall or some kind of a divider, it's actually hard to, to arrange your tools. I think having walls and corners and things give you really good convenient places to come up with creative solutions. And if you just have a big open space, you tend to waste a lot of space, I think. So, yeah. so well, I guess that's pretty much it. We appreciate your time and uh, we've enjoyed our, our little trip to Ohio. Nicole's nodding her head, but you can't hear her. <laughs> uh, yeah, but we just wanted to thank you guys. It was awesome. And um, well, I guess we'll be seeing you on the interwebs, on the intertubes. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. I appreciate yeah, it, man. Thank you. All right.
What's it like to have the wood whisperer in your shop? I think the one of the the child crapped herself even when it happened. <laughs> it's pretty freaking awesome. I mean, I mean, we've had to keep the people outside today, and we're running out of police tape. I almost crapped myself when it happened. It was a, it was cacophonous. You know, it's, it's uh, what are you gonna do? Yeah, everybody would be raging. Yeah. We don't, we, we don't have makeovers. This isn't about me. Yeah. It's about Chris. <laughs>